Steve Ottoling. I work with Dane County Land Conservation. Our office is kind of, uh, for most of you may already know this, but um, I work with Land Conservation, which is a division of Dane County Land and Water Resources. Um, our office is set up with a urban our component, which deals with permitting, um, uh, issues with urban runoff issues, and then there's the rural portion, which is what I work with. And that's, uh, we deal with uh, landowners. Um, my primary um, responsibility is working with landowners in the Lake Mendota Priority Watershed. I'm hoping to kind of cover four things tonight. I'm going to start out with just kind of the basic, um, Ag's kind of role in the county as a whole. Um, then we're going to kind of deal with some of the challenges Ag brings to the table in terms of the Yahara chain of lakes. Then I'm going to cover some of the progress that's gone on over the past many years. And finally, what is the future? What do we look to towards the future? Um, I want to get a pointer out. I apologize here. Uh, um, when we think of the water resources in Dane County, um, why are you, you know, it's quite vast. You know, we have over 20,000 acres of, of just surface water in general. You know, we have the 475 miles of stream, 14 miles of the Wisconsin River actually um, go along the edge of Dane County. We have over 52,000 acres of wetlands and 67 lakes and ponds, there's actually many more, but those are the ones that are kind of identified. And a big point is all our drinking water comes from groundwater. Uh, when we talk about Ag and Dane County, am I in your way, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, the agricultural income from Dane County, Dane County actually ranks 40th in the United States of all the counties in terms of total Ag income. When we look at it on a statewide basis, in terms, you know, Ag and Dane County were first in total corn income, second in corn silage, second in soybeans, third in the number of dairy cows and actually the amount of milk produced in the state, and we're second in all, count, in all cattle in the state. Again, going back to Ag's role in the county, um, I hope this is large enough for people to see. You know, it, uh, is, it's responsible for almost 24,000 jobs. It has an economic impact of over $3 billion. Um, it contributes $1.1 billion in total income to the county and it pays over a hundred million in just taxes, not including the property taxes paid on the land. Then as we break it down more into the Yahara watershed and looking at Ag's impact there, as you look at, it covers through the center of the county over 1,200 farms, which is 36 of the 36% of the total farms in the county actually are in the Yahara watershed. Of those farms, 242 have our livestock, you know, and many of those farms have multiple livestock operations, multiple lots affiliated with them. Um, we have over 30,000 dairy cows, which is actually 60% of the cows in the county. And actually the farm size in the Yahara watershed is actually larger than the, tip, the average farm in the county. We see it on average about 175 cows on a farm in the Yahara watershed versus just 135 county wide. And we produce over almost 50,000 acres of corn and over 13,000 acres of soybeans. If people have questions as I go, please, we have a small group, we can Please ask them. Oh, I'm moving away from the mic. No, no, you're fine. I'm moving up here. So what are some of the stresses that, that agricultural lead, operations lead to the Yahara Lakes? 
you know, a big challenge is just the value of the land. The, the, the land in the watershed is um, so valuable, and especially as you look at other uses. Um, you look at statewide cost of land that's being converted to uses other than ag, just 6,000, but when you look at Dane County, we're up over 20,000. We have a, another challenge that's occurring is, or not a challenge, but just a fact of life, is that the farms are expanding. Here is an example of a farm in the watershed in, 2000, in the year 2000, and here it is today in 2010. You know, farms are expanding for multiple reasons. Some of it's just financial to be able to compete, um, but there's also the issue of family reasons for expanding maybe to create more opportunities as some of the children come in and farm along. Um, there's also the issue of to have a more, uh, a, the way of life, to be able to have certain days off versus the typical farm 50 years ago where it was milking twice a day, seven days a week. You know, the farmers are really attempting to get their lifestyle so that they're able to see their kids' events, and that's led to some of the expansions. We also have land use pressure just from development. And this is kind of a challenge to the farms also. You know, and again, 1995, we actually have a farming operation. The whole area is being farmed. By 2000, it's starting to get developed. And, by, and today, the area is completely developed. With a golf course. Yes. You know, these land use pressures, you know, as the farm operations have gotten larger, um, you know, more milk, more manure, more need for land base. Um, there's that big question to a lot of farmers, especially right outside of some of the municipalities in the watershed. You know, do I, what kind of changes do I make, keeping in mind that is this land going to be developed in 10 years? How much? money do I invest into my operation looking at whether or not this is being developed. You know, again, there's limited land. The high land values are a challenge. And of course we have our rural-urban conflicts, be it road traffic, travel, odor, manure applications, things such as that. Through our job, um, again, one of our biggest goals is to keep the sediment and the nutrients out of the lakes. Um, and we do this back in 1997, uh, a big study was done on the lakes and they wanted to identify where was the fo phosphorus load coming that was going into Lake Mendota. At that point it was determined as you can see, 48% of the phosphorus load was from cropland. We had 6% from the existing urban area. A major part at that time, the economy was quite strong back in 97. 19% was from construction sites. 21% of the phosphorus came from barnyards. And another 6% from stream banks. As the farms have expanded, we've had a, a change in just the, the type of manure that's being produced. We've gone from a solid type of manure to more of a, a liquid type of manure. The biggest challenge with that is the solid manure is more stable as it is applied to the land. Less opportunity for it to wash off with rain. The solids kind of captures the raindrops, holding it in place. The liquid manure has uh, more, it seems to run off at a higher percentage. Steve, do you know if, um, like, do, do the feedlots have more runoff if they're bigger versus if they're smaller um, per, maybe per square foot, or uh, is it more intense? Um, what happens is 
as they get bigger, it's actually the opening area. You have a, the larger waterfall effect, watershed effect. You know, you have more rainwater coming through, which can increase the runoff. Another big part would be concentration of animals. More animals, you're going to have more manure, so the higher potential for it to run off. Next yes, please. That. Has there been any education done with uh, the farmers in the areas that are in the watershed on, on just this topic where uh, information is given to them, people go out and talk with them? And uh, could you and answer a second question for me? What is the cost savings or what is the cost difference between a farmer using a liquid manure versus a solid manure? So that I can maybe understand why they're doing it. Uh, I'm gonna. Um, I'll take the second question first. Um, as the farms have expanded, and some of the their methods of handling the cattle has led to a more liquid. Um, they've moved away from the straw bedding. One of the big changes in agriculture in the last 20 years is they've gone to either. Um, sand as a bedding material, which doesn't soak up the One of the reasons they use it is it stays dry and bacteria isn't able to grow in it. Um, versus when I was on the farm, we used straw which soaked up the water but then became wet, which actually became kind of a health hazard for the cattle. Um, so the farms have gone to either sand or they've gone to mattresses, which are just um, old tires ground up into mattresses as their way of comfort for the cattle and that's led to more of a liquid type of manure. So um, it's been kind of the economy of scale that's led to the liquid and ease of handling. As the, um, the education, I actually, I think I'm going to cover that because we've actually been doing that uh, quite a bit the past uh, five to seven years. <coughs> Another issue that we've been dealing with is rising phosphorus levels in the soil. What happens um, as these phosphorus binds with the soil particles and as these levels are rising within the soil um, and typically what the UW would consider is um, an optimal soil phosphorus level would be approximately 30. Um, once it gets above a, a hundred parts per million, it's considered very high. We're actually finding some farms that are 300 plus. The phosphorus binds with the soil particles as there's always some natural erosion occurring. As that washes off, that's what the the soil that's leaving the fields is very high in phosphorus, it gets into surface water, which is causing some of the problems. Um, this, I'm hoping this answers your question in terms of the, the winter spreading of liquid manure has become more common. Um, a lot of the farms don't have adequate storage or capacity to store all the manure that is produced on the farm over through the winter months, the six months through the winter. Um, many times it's just economically not feasible for them to construct those storage structures. They're very costly and in terms of the business, they don't have a direct payback to them versus a building where they can house more animals. Um, and that has led to some large scale uh, manure runoff events. Many of you are probably uh, know of what happened back in the February of 2005. Um, there was a fish kill in Western Dane County on the west branch of the Sugar River, and there was a large discharge into Dorn Creek, which leads into Lake Mendota um, on the northwest part of the lake. This led to a change in Dane County's ordinance, which now requires for farmers to spread liquid pumpable manure in the winter, 
and again it's just liquid, they're required to have a winter spreading plan through our office. Oh, I have a question, Steve. Does, do you guys keep track of how many acres per cow there are in the watershed or with some of these farms that, um, I know that, you know, it's farms that are over 700 cows that need to get the permits, yeah. but, um, you know, the, some of the farms that are um, getting these uh, application permits, do they have to show that they have a certain amount of land per cow? Uh, we, we, um, one of the permits in the, that they're required to get is if they build a manure storage structure, they're required to get a, a permit from Dane County. And as part of that, they're required to submit a nutrient management plan. Um, and through the nutrient management plan, they need to demonstrate that they have adequate acres to safely spread the waste that's produced on the farm. I've got a question. Is there a way to incentivize uh, farmers to uh, be able to build these storage structures? You acknowledge that was a problem. Uh, is there a solution out there someplace that would be feasible? Um, there are some programs available right now that share in the cost. Um, and typically, um, we fund two to three a year in the county. So the funding is quite limited. But that, that's the method that we're working on right now is producers can apply for funding and, and they, it's possibly approximately 70% of the cost to construct it. And that comes from county tax dollars? It's actually, this is federal funds. Fed, yeah. um, as part of that winter spreading permit, um, actually 29 operations in Lake Mendota applied for through our office and were re received a winter spreading permit. And what that does is it, it goes through the cropland they operate and it, it uh, specifies the amount of manure, the amount of liquid manure, I have to be specific on that, that they can spread through the winter months. And it depends on the slope of the land. There's actually also, no spread areas that are identified in that plan. 300 feet from a, a, a river or a drainage ditch or 1,000 feet from a lake is considered a no spread area for liquid manure in the winter. And then depending on the land slope, it maximizes either 5,000 gallons per acre, 6,000 or 7,000 gallons. So do you have to monitor? Farmers who may or may not have a permit? Uh, um, if, yes, um, we do it in two ways. Um, we do what we consider, we call status reviews, where there's a random sample that we go out and visit every year. Um, and part of that permit process is that there are required to maintain records of where they actually, the date they spread, the amount they spread. And um, so from there, we kind of cross reference that they're following their permit. And we also deal with um, on a complaint basis. So um, as a complaint comes in, we always go out and investigate. Um, one of the advantages we have is we do through all the years, um, like I've been in with the county for 23 years, Kevin Connors, who's the director, is sitting back there. He can like, um, has been 30 plus. Yeah. So we have built a strong working relationship with the farmers. So when these complaints do come in, we have pretty good contacts. How good is the compliance with that? Are the farmers trying to? They, they really are, yes. Um, and and it's, it's getting much better every year. Um, as they, you know, it was difficult back in 2007 because um, there's a lot of factors. When they think about spreading manure, um, many times, you know, weather conditions are such, you know, what we would may think is not the best time to spread environmentally for them it, it's 
the most opportune because they don't want to cause compaction to the soil, you know, and so that's one of the issues. And as they start, as we start getting our message across and they become more comfortable with the permitting process, the compliance is gone. And I'll send out notices when it's kind of a no spread, kind of a... Yeah. When conditions when are, conditions yeah. Are, which they used to do, now they say uh, soil moisture and rain, and it's just not a good time to be spreading. So what, that helps. Yeah, what you'll hear is uh, the press release saying yeah. that the weather is warming and we're foreseeing a snow melt, we're asking people not to spread or rain very much like Suzanne said. So I guess from a naive person's standpoint, uh, it seems like their their issue is, is getting rid of the manure. They don't need it on the crop land anymore because they've got plenty of phosphorus, or is that inaccurate? Uh, they still use it for a couple. Um, there's also, when we look at fertilizer, we're usually looking at three main components. We're looking at nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And manure has a mixture of all three. Um, it, it's, it's pretty much equal between nitrogen and phosphorus, and then potassium is a higher, and right now we're not concerned with phosphorus. Phosphor, or, um, excuse me, i got to say it, we say that. We're not concerned with potassium in the environment levels. Um, so when they're applying, they're actually applying for all three of those nutrients. And one of the things that happens is if you apply manure for a growing crop need for nitrogen, you act because corn uses about twice as much nitrogen as it uses a phosphorus to grow a crop. So if you apply manure at the nitrogen base, you're actually applying twice as much phosphorus. And that's one of the reasons that we're seeing the buildup in the soil. Can I add to that? Yes. Um, I work on water issues for Clean Wisconsin, and so we look at this problem a lot because it's a it's a problem around the state. And the you know one of the guidelines that farmers use to spread manure is based on how much the plant. What's the maximum amount you can put on the plant to maximize its growth? And those guidelines consider plant growth, but they don't consider the chances of runoff and the other implications of it. So. Um, you know, maybe one of the, you know, things that can happen at the state level or policy-wise is, um, or with Natural Resources Conservation Service, is looking at the balance between crop needs and potential for runoff. Another issue we run up, run into, which is quite a challenge, is just the historical location of where the farm was built back in the 1800s. Um, you know, back then they were thinking, I want to be close to water, my cattle need water, the, the people living in the house need water. So they were constructed in very environmentally sensitive areas. Then over the years the farm expanded, um, it kind of led to more problems. Um, and, and what we challenge with, are challenged with as an office is, what do we present to somebody in this situation where the farm is located in such an environmentally sensitive area, it's, it's almost cost prohibitive to correct the issue. Um, is buying them out the right option there? And again, you're looking at a farm that's been in the family multi-generations, and it's their way of life. Um, so the challenge is deciding is it best to spend the money to correct the situation or is it better for us to buy an easement on the property or something like that? Steve? Yes, please. Are, is a farm like that tiled, like the fields are tiled to drain the fields or is it that they're um, they uh, Probably a little of both, you know. Um, I, I'm not so sure they actually flood as much as they deal with a saturation problem. Yeah, um, this blue actually is just hydric soils, which are wetter soils, you know. Um, but 
I'm sure in the crop fields you're going to see the tile as you talk. The other issue we deal with is many times the farm actually owns multiple animal lots, which again, the question comes to the landowner, which one do they work on first? Um, we also deal with multiple owners. As the farms have grown, many times it's two brothers or three brothers that have gone in the farm, and, and the idea is getting those owners to all agree on the same solution. Now I'm going to kind of move into the phase of what's happened in the past. Um, a big part of what I've done is I worked on the Lake Mendota Priority Watership Project. The Lake Mendota Priority Watershed, and we were talking about the watershed, you know, today we're talking about the whole Yahara watershed covering all the way into Rock County. The Lake Mendota Priority Watershed was actually a state-funded program. It started in 1993. Implementation started in 1997, and that dealt with only the portion of the <coughs> watershed draining up and into Lake Mendota. So we started into Columbia County and, and the project area ended as the water entered Lake Mendota. Through that program we met with the landowners up there and, and kind of getting across the goal of the project. The number one goal of the project was controlling soil erosion. Um, through the implementation of conservation practices, we wanted to keep the soil on the land. Then we kind of built off of that, focusing on nutrient management, which was kind of what, I'll cover that in a little bit. Then we went into water management, um, minimizing runoff, water runoff, barnyard runoff, and then wetland restoration. The etc. cetera um, would be like uh, wildlife habitat practices. The concept of the program was the farmers would move through the tiers as they, if they, as they wanted cost sharing. So if somebody wanted cost sharing for barnyard runoff, first they had to uh, prove that they had soil erosion under control, nutrient management, and water management practices in place, then we would work with them on barnyard runoff type practices. Um, through that period, um, it was kind of a combination of state and federal funds, some county funds also. Um, over $2 million was uh, available or spent uh, on conservation practices. Typically through that um, program, cost sharing was 70% of what it cost to implement the practice, and the landowner was responsible for 30%. So it was a 70-30 type of uh, deal. Participation was very high. 42% um, of the eligible farmers, so these were people that we considered had issues that needed to be dealt with, actually uh, applied conservation practices. And many of those, in terms of reducing soil erosion, we're talking about grass waterways, which is just a grass channel through the area, the concentrated flow areas to stabilize them, give the water a safe grass place, a grassed area to run so erosion doesn't occur. We did some stream bank protection, contour strip cropping, and nutrient management. So by the mid 1960s, through the progress of that program, Almost 90% of all cropland in the watershed is at or, or below what we consider soilable, soil, uh, tolerable soil loss levels. And that would be considered the, the current standard for what we expect farmers to participate under. Um, nutrient management, that's kind of what we were talking about um, as 
though, is the goal of nutrient management is for the farmers to, you know, they're going to grow a certain crop. Say it be corn or alfalfa, soybeans. And, and what happens through nutrient management is they factor in the nutrients that are actually grown on the farm or produced on the farm, you know, the manure, legume credits from the crops, and then they take that plus commercial fertilizer that they would buy and they, they match that to the growing crop's needs. So the goal is that <coughs> we're not over applying nutrients. And a couple concerns with over applying is you're dealing with excess nitrogen can leach into the groundwater and excess phosphorus can run off. So again, the big goal is just for them to manage, is to balance what the crop needs to what they're actually applying. Through the Lake Mendota Priority Watershed um, and our work with the landowners up there, 45% of the producers are now developing and following nutrient management plans in the watershed. Steve, has that increased in the last couple of years? I was told some of the smaller farmers that under the farmland preservation plan that was adopted a year or two ago needed to have nutrient management plans for the first time. And so I was wondering if the participation rate, just the knowledge base would be increased. It, 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 it's, um, yes, what happened is um, as the way current state law is set up is um, farmers are, are expected to follow these standards, but we cannot enforce unless cost sharing is offered. And so, so we run out of money. It, what happened in the past year is they added, as a condition of raising, uh, receiving farmland preservation tax credits, and what that is is if your land is zoned Ag 1, um, you can get a reduction in your state taxes based on the amount of property taxes you pay. And they added that requirement, just like you said. Now, to be eligible for farmland preservation tax credits, you are required to follow a nutrient management plan. They do give you five years to work into that. But yes, it, it has really increased uh, phone calls to our office, specifically on nutrient management. Well, then it would also increase the knowledge base of the farmers that now have got the data yes. and had to prepare the plan. So I was, as you mentioned that as an element of your outreach and education, there's a lot more data out there than that too. Yes, there is. Steve, as you focus on phosphorus runoff from agricultural lands in the Minota watershed, what percentage of phosphorus comes from manure as opposed to commercial fertilizers? I can't answer. I, I don't guess. Know. <laughs> what would be roughly, I mean, is, does most of it come from manure or some? Does it matter? I guess it really doesn't. We, we, when I talk nutrient management to farmers, um, I, we're talking all nutrients. Um, the focus is more on manure, probably because of the timing of the year that it's applied. Like, um, farmers would never <coughs> purchase commercial fertilizer and spread it in December so really or January. Commercial fertilizer isn't so much of a problem, is what I'm hearing you say. Right. Okay. Yeah, because typically they're spreading it just before the plant, you know, right at the time when the plant can use it, and many times they're working it in right away. But that would contribute to the overall <laughs> yes. concentration, yes. hence to run off. Right? And, you know, I'm past that slide, but an interesting part about that high concentration of phosphorus in the soils, um, back as I grew up on a farm, um, you were very proud if your fertilizer values in your soil were, were rising because it, it said you were taking care of the land. You know, it was, and it also was the idea that you were creating a bank of fertilizer in there for future years. The issue is it's just gotten 
and too high. Mm -hmm. so. you, if you're not a live, if you're not a livestock <coughs> farmer, if you're just a crop farmer, you're going to be using more purchased yeah. commercial than you are um, if you have ready access to them. So that's and something to think about. For those areas that are. Um, High phosphorus concentrations. Do they have high nitrogen concentrations? Because my understanding is that nitrogen will move through the soil into the groundwater. So if you're trying to use enough more, uh, manure to have decent nitrogen levels, you might keep applying and the phosphorus will stay in the soil. It doesn't move through the soil to the groundwater and go away. It stays there. So the different nutrients move in different ways. It, it, right. And, and nitrogen... There is a residual effect in the soil, but it's very small. So when a farmer soil tests, they're actually not testing for nitrogen. They're only testing for phosphorus and potassium because nitrogen is looked at as, as an annual application because of the leaching that occurs. Another big part was installing grass buffers along surface water. You know, the whole idea was you, you buffer either a stream or a drainage ditch within a crop field. As water runs off, it has to flow through the grass, and that grass removes the nutrients, keeping it from getting in the water. And part of the Lake Mendota project, we actually installed buffers along 12.8 miles of streams in the watershed. And as urban has the rain garden, in ag we have water and sediment control pra practices, which are really dams. The whole idea is to capture the water, slow it down, hopefully some infiltrates, some evaporates. Um, the idea is we call them water management practices to keep the water on the land, slow the runoff. And we were able to restore 18.8 acres of cropland back to wetlands. Again, the wetlands function as filters. They also function as sponges to reduce the runoff during heavy rainfall events. And barnyard runoff. You know, one of the earlier slides said that there was 242 farms just in the whole Yahara watershed. As part of the Lake Mendota project, we actually inventoried 300 animal lots. Why is the number different? Many of the farms that we work with have three, four, five different animal lots as part of their operation. Of that, 79 animal lots actually made changes to either management or installed conservation practices to reduce runoff. And that accounted for 72% of the project goal. So why are we here? Yahara Clean, um, the celebration. What Yahara Clean was, the next step in the process was just a total evaluation of the Yahara watershed, trying to identify some of the issues that are cha challenging water quality. Um, it was done by using the most up-to-date models. Um, the SWAT model, soil and water analysis assessment, assessment tool. Thank you. I knew it 10 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> But through the SWAT model, we were able to identify what we consider the highest loading subwatersheds in, in the Yahara. And most of those we noticed were above Lake Mendota. And what that led to is where we're moving to now, kind of act, uh, opportunities in the future. You know, as we went into Yahara Clean, we wanted to build on our past projects. I talked about when we started with the Lake Mendota watershed back in 1997, we actually surveyed 
the landowners, the farmers in the area, on what their future plans were and how that would have affect the benefit or the environment. Now we're going back and we're resurveying those individuals to see if we can notify or can identify any trends in terms of their views towards the environment, what steps they've taken. Uh, we're using the SWAP model and SNAP plus models to identify conservation practices to reduce runoff. We entered in with, partnered with NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service, which is the federal uh, agency that deals with farm issues on funding through the Mississippi Basin Initiative. We're looking at new approaches to conservation and we're working on building partnerships. The first thing we're looking at, there's current rules that farmers are expected to follow, state rules. One of the things you mentioned, the farmland preservation program. Not only are they required a nutrient management plan, but they're actually required to be in compliance with all current state rules. So the first step as we look towards the higher clean is just making sure, working with the farmers to come into compliance with those rules. In terms of cropland, they're expected to have soil loss down to what's considered acceptable levels, tolerable soil loss levels. They're expected to follow a nutrient management plan. When they look at livestock, they're not allowed to have any direct discharge from their animal lots to waters of the state. They're expected to limit livestock access to surface water. The idea there is that the, the animals are not able to disturb the grass along the banks of streams or lakes. And all manure storage structures are to be constructed to proper standards. Through the SWAT model, we were able to identify two sub-watersheds that had a high percentage of the runoff, our phosphorus runoff, reaching Lake Mendota. And we were able to apply through the federal government as part of their environmental quality incentive program, EQUIP, uh, a special project that provided funding in these two sub-watersheds for conservation practices. Um, it actually opened up possibly $2 million over the next few years to install conservation practices in those two areas. Kind of the goal of the Mississippi River Basin Initiative was kind of target the highest nutrient areas first. So that's why we picked those two sub-watersheds. We want to work with as many producers in those areas as possible. We started with a, a, a mass mailing, and now we're kind of going door to door, working with these producers. Discussing the program, we're actually reevaluating the farms. The, the original evaluation occurred back in 1997. We're now 14 years later. We're looking at changes that have occurred and whether or not they load or has increased or decreased. Um, we're looking at establishing, identifying practices that will reduce the runoff and establishing cost estimates for the producers. We're, we're really focusing on uh, soil testing. We want to get a good handle of what the current phosphorus level in the soil is and because that as the phosphorus level increases in the soil, the potential for phosphorus runoff increases. And we're using the SNAP Plus uh, model, which is a nutrient management plus soil erosion model to analyze on a field-by-field -field basis and offer recommendations on how to reduce runoff. And if this is successful, we're hoping to repeat it in other sub-watersheds in the future. Steve, I have a yeah. question. With the uh, MRVI, uh, they're paying for a lot of the practices. Do they pay for staff time, or does that come out from the Dade County budget? That's that's a tremendous amount of one-on-one -on -one and staff time. Yeah, um, we, we've actually received funding. That's kind of in the build partnerships. 
Um, the, the Clean Lakes Alliance actually offered us some funding. Uh, San County Foundation did. Um, we're actually hoping to hire three people. And the NRCS Natural Resource Conservation Service has also given us our entered into a cooperate cooperative agreement to cover some staffing. On. Through this program, again, it's a cost share program. So a portion, funds are available to cover a portion of the cost of the project and the landowner is expected to cover. And it's typically a 70, 75, 25, 30% to the landowner cost. 75 from the, uh, through cost share funds and 25 from the landowner. Another item that we, through the Murby is we actually installed a monitoring system. You know, how effective are our conservation practices? We have a lot of confidence in them, but not always do the landowners. Uh, this is a monitoring system that was installed uh, north of Wanakee. The idea behind this is we're gonna, um, we wanna get baseline data, and then we wanna analyze what benefit do we get from uh, using winter cover crops, uh, difference in timing of applications of liquid manure, uh, possibly incorporating the manure instead of applying it on the surface. So, um, and we actually are planning to put a second one in this spring, and that one will focus on grass buffers and changing, uh, tillage changing. Redu leaving more residue on top, such as no-till, and how much can we reduce the runoff from the site? Hey, have you noticed the change in, like, the, the dairy operations seem to have a lot more corn silage now and less alfalfa? So, probably over the last 10 years, at least in our neighborhood, you see a lot more fields yes. that are going for corn silage. They're open for a big part of the year after the silage comes off versus having a permanent bed of alfalfa in there for three or maybe four years. And that's been a trend that's happening probably the last 20 years, as they're using the corn silage as an energy base for the dairy herd. Um, and, and actually that's where this monitoring system is we're pushing cover crops. So once they harvest the corn silage, we understand the need that they need the, grain, the corn for feed so then they would plant a cover crop to keep it uh, a grass, a wheat, or a rye, so it has something green and growing and it has cover over the winter. Um, today was a big day for our office, for Kevin, as he put many years into, they had uh, a press conference for the community manure facility uh, north of Wanakee. It, it's actually up and running. It's producing electricity that's going onto the grid. Um, as we look at these facilities, we actually have many goals, but these are kind of the main goals. One is we want is to create energy. The second one is to manage the phosphorus. Through the facility that was put on, part of the process is once the manure goes through the digester and the gas is produced, whatever goes into the digester comes back out. But that system has a solid separator which takes the solids out of the manure and, and the solids actually hold, um, contain most of the phosphorus that's in there. And the goal of that project is that phosphorus is going to be sold as a mulch um, to landscapers um, so the idea is we're going to remove 60% of the phosphorus that was in the manure that goes into the digester will actually be removed out of the watershed. Is that a requirement? How do we know where that highly concentrated material really is going? Um, oh, Kevin? please, Kevin. Me, I'll, I'll take this one. Uh, we know it because we have a contract. Okay. But first of all, uh, the... Kind of the business plan for these facilities is the majority, a significant portion of the revenue to make this effort sustainable is for the sale of the fiber. Okay, so there are ready markets. There's actually a 
demand, a huge market demand for this fiber. Uh, for nurseries, as Steve mentioned, wholesale markets for soil amendments. It would just be nice to know that the nurseries are in Eau Claire and Wausau. Not <laughs> well, you know, it, it's... Get us away from here. Could be going to your garden, too. It, it's not going back on the crop land in the park. Okay. That, that's... The, this, the, the purpose of these facilities is to remove phosphorus from the watershed. The farmers, the only way they can get access to any of the fiber is to actually purchase it back from the facility and use it for bedding. But because it's a closed loop system, it's automatically pumped back into the digester tanks. Thank you. And, and the remaining substrate, once the solids is removed, is pumped back to the farm. And the advantage of that is, as we talked earlier about when you apply manure to corn for the nitrogen, you actually double apply the phosphorus. This substrate is what I'm going to call it, that goes back to the farm, actually has a nutrient content that better matches what you would want to put on for corn kind of getting away from that over-applying of phosphorus as you put the manure on the meat, the nitrogen needs of the corn. Um, it reduces odor, which is a big benefit when you think of the urban-rural conflicts that we deal with. And right now, a second facility is being planned close to Middleton, which the one that was that is up and running right now involves three farms, the one in Middleton would actually involve four farms. Our office is working with DNR, our, with DNR, and we're also working with Madison Metropolitan Sewage District on cons looking into a, a nutrient trading program. The idea is setting um, the power, uh, the the sewage treatment plants need to make changes to reduce their phosphorus runoff. It's very expensive. We believe we may be able to get larger gains by taking some of that money and applying it onto the rural area. So the idea is a nutrient trading. They would provide funding so that farmers could in install conservation practices to reduce phosphorus runoff. Without getting political in this, but with what's going on in the state budget with the phosphorus, would this be as viable under the current proposed budget with this cutting of phosphorus requirements? Yeah, the governor's budget intends to um, uh, undercut that rule, but they actually just released a memo today called the errata memo that's like a technical addition to the budget, and it says that they are going to move from uh, effectively getting rid of the rule to merely delaying implementation of the rule. Um, they didn't say by how long, so we don't know exactly what that means. What, yeah, what does it get us? Well, in the meantime, they'll be working on guidance language, so um, there's trading, and at a state level, we have to change some of the policies related to trading. Uh, Dave Taylor from MSD and us and Dane County and a couple of people work on the um, what's going on with changing trading and making updating it so that we can use it now, and, you know, because the old statute's like 15 years old. Um, and then... Also, with the phosphorus rule, there's this adaptive management option that's um, kind of more comprehensive in scope than trading. It's not just offsetting your pollution, it's um, cleaning up the, you know, guaranteeing that you're going to clean it up enough so the water is restored again. Um, so there's a lot of work to do in the meantime. Um, if it's not delayed for too long, then it'll, it'll be fine. I think it'll take a year to get the guidance language done and some of the logistical stuff done. And I'll, I didn't notice Dave back there. I'm sorry, he's in the That's back okay. of church. <laughs> but uh, he's been very instrumental in this. Uh, as, we, as I kind of wrap up, what are some of the hurdles? We kind of covered most of them through the, um, through the questions. You know, for us to be successful, we need a large buy-in from the producer, from the ag producer. Um, 
you know, Suzanne touched on the staffing issue. We're making a huge staffing commitment as we look at functioning within these sub-watersheds. Um, will we have enough staff to meet that goal? Um, we can talk budgets forever. Um, it, the, the other challenge is always the timeline of a project. Um, you know, we're always looking at, we want to see immediate results, and I understand that, versus the life, the line of a farm, of what it takes to implement things. Um, you know, when we look at lowering the soil, the soil phosphorus level, it can take many, many years, be 15 to 30 to bring some of those, even if we didn't apply any phosphorus to the field starting today, just from growing. So kind of being realistic with our time frame is always important. When you talk about the phosphorus inputs from the agricultural community, we tend to concentrate more on the livestock operation and farm manure, but there's a big part of the community out there that's cash cropping, that's applying artificial fertilizers, and exporting a significant volume of the crop off the farm versus recycling it back. So when you look at the hot spots and the sort of the priority areas to focus on, how do the cash crop and the livestock operations sort of balance out? Um, it, it's the livestock. Um, what's happened in the past, there's been a great increase in the price of fertilizer the past five years. So, and, and nutrient management has been very successful too, but as a cash, you know, many times it, it's, they have the manure, it's only economical to take it so far so the same fields get covered versus the cash grain is, they're only purchasing really what they need. So um, the SWAT model definitely showed the hot spots for where the cattle were, high concentrations of cattle. Well, the models, I just want to mention tile lines before. There's quite a bit of phosphorus and nitrogen and sediment that goes through the tile lines. That's really not accounted for in any of these models, is it? Is that my understanding? No. Um, and the latest, you know, I showed that modeling system, or uh, the, the, the one that we're looking at, we're hoping to add a tile line component. I'm not sure we're going to have the funds. That was, it was quite a bit more than just the basic model. But that was one of, the site we have is ideally located where we could model what comes out of the tile line also. Is a lot of the Ahara tiled? I know that I work in a lot of lower areas of the basin that it's a lot of uh, um, A much smaller percentage than the lower Yahara. You know, there are the hydric or wet soils um, that are tiled, but sure. it's a small percentage versus when you think of Deer field, or you think of Dodge County, Jefferson yes, County, correct. Really, right. really and just so you know, Steve, it's eight thirty. So oh, I have one. So okay, perfect. <laughs> Actually, two. We slowed up. <laughs> <laughs> um, when we look at kind of wrapping up for Lake Medota, this is actually the third go around in terms of watershed projects. There was a six mile one back in the 70s, then there was an early 80s, and there was the Lake Mendota priority one in the 90s and early 2000s, and now we have Yahara Clean. You know, we have accomplished a lot, um, and we can't say enough about the producers up there, how willing they are to talk to us, how open they are to uh, ideas. Um, one of the advantages we have are they really are family operations and they're thinking long term. I have to keep this farm viable because the next generation is coming. Uh, we're still working on <coughs> identifying the obstacles and I talked about the timeline. And finally, um, this is actually a photo of the 
farms, the three farms that are participating with the Digester project. You know, and for us, it's it's always working together. We do have the same goals, no matter what organization or industry we're in. We do have the same goals. I really appreciate your time, and the questions were great. So, thank you. Thank you. One thing this gentleman had asked a question, and I've been to a lot of these over the last few years about reaching up to the farmers, or did the farmers know this and were they getting this information? And the Nelson Institute sponsored two years ago this press February. Um, an all-day seminar on exactly this, the phosphorus in the lake, in the Yahara watershed. There were over, I, I want to say, 90 farmers that participated in that day, and there's been a lot of reach out for urban dwellers, reaching out to the egg so that it's not just blaming them, but it's how, and I think the Clean Lakes Alliance was alluded to tonight, they're actively recruiting. How can we use the money we raise in the urban area? Can we go back to help that? So I think the farmers, although cautious, have been very receptive to better practices. It's an economic balance. From, from someone who has no knowledge of this prior to coming here, this has been immensely informative. And, and I think to expand on what you were saying is that it would be a really good thing to 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 meld the the farm communities with the urban uh, you know increase my knowledge of, of this because I had a real you know un, uninformed view of what what was happening it's the only way it's going to work right it, it'll right never exactly. Work. <laughs> exactly unless we're all holding hands exactly. together on exactly this, and very different needs and concerns what, what's an easy way to test for that phosphorus? The gentleman next to me, we're from uh, the north side of where your okay. initiatives are. We're from the forest, sure. where the Yahar River starts. And we're going to be doing some monitoring. We're partnering with the DNR. We've got some equipment that's going in the water within the next month or so. But for some reason, uh, Mike Sorge, who we're working with, sure. hasn't mentioned phosphorus as something that we're testing for. It could be that we are. So I'm asking the question from a member of uh, this group. Do I am I able to just take some bottles, stick it in the water, and take it somewhere and say, "Tell me how many parts of phosphorus are, are in, in the river at this juncture? How how easy or how complicated is this to do?" That? Well, you can do a soil test, and you can find out what the soil test numbers are in the soil, like how many parts per million of phosphorus there are. And remember that map that had the maps of the watershed, and it was colored, and there's the dark red areas? You know, those are areas where a lot of runoff of phosphorus happens on. So if you know that there's land that has a lot of phosphorus and it's steeply sloped, that's probably one of those target areas where we can make a difference. So um, be, they're monitoring yeah, surface we're, water. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're, so, we're, if, can, if I can jump in. Okay. I'm, I'm Suzanne Wade. I work with the Rock River Coalition and the UW Extension has done a lot of working with citizen so, monitors. If you're doing phosphorus, you really have to have a very good plan. Um, you have, because the water is moving, it's harder than in a lake. So if you've got an event and you're not there to sample at the right time, you might miss important information. And when you collect phosphorus, phosphorus is complicated because it's in the water in a couple of different, um, uh, some of it is uh, in the water dissolved, some of it is attached to soil, and some of it is actually part of moving objects or dead objects. And so you have to do what's called total phosphorus. The best way to do it is to do it by uh, learning how to take a sample properly and then sending it to the state lab or IG or some other lab. Um, and that can get costly. So there are um, planning grants, there are other things that you can do to help cost share that type of thing. But in doing that, you can work with USGS, state, county, to figure out a really good strategy so you're collecting the samples at the right time so it's meaningful information.
Well, the other thing too is is the work that you guys are doing that's being supported by Mike uh, Sorgi and Pete Jackie uh, is from our office. You know, we have several citizen volunteer monitoring teams throughout the watershed, and so the work that you're doing are, are, is extremely valuable and important. You know, for for you to not only collect that data but also to put it on the statewide database, so that's part of that long-term monitoring. That uh, Steve mentioned. Uh, it's not a, Sue mentioned, Suzanne mentioned, phosphorus is one of those difficult uh, constituents to monitor and to collect data for. But, you know, we leave that up to specialists like USGS. Okay. See, the other thing is, is the type of monitoring you're going to be doing can indirectly tell us what's happening with phosphorus. Because you'll be looking at the critters. Who are living there, they'll tell you about the health of the water, the amount of oxygen, that's an idea to the oxygen, you'll be doing the flow, you'll be doing how clear it is. All those things help tell you a lot about the health of the water without actually having to do the phosphorus because you know, a lot of that is, is the critters are there all the time. So if you've got not the best water quality, those critters are going to tell you that because you may have missed the really bad times that happen. They'll tell you if it's there, and if you're seeing one, the critters that like it be better water quality, um, they're going to tell you that too, that maybe you had a, a few days of really turbid water, but it was an unusual event. So some of the things that, that you're working with some really good people who know um, what citizens can test and what kind of information you can get from them. Because I know they're talking to you about both the basic, the tier one, the water action volunteer, and doing tier two. So they're, they're giving you some more advanced information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's right. I'm ready for it. Steve, that was an outstanding presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to get a copy of your slides. Can I do that? You sure can. Oh, thank you.